The epistle reading today is found in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us in all our affliction so that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction with the consolation which means we ourselves are consoled by God. Well, I usually mention this at the beginning of the service, but if you're a visitor joining us today here in the sanctuary or on our Facebook live stream, we want to welcome you here with us, and uh, we are graced by your presence on this special day. We invite you to fill out that uh, little pop-up on the screen on your Facebook page or uh, one of the cards in the parlor if you're here. But God is good, and uh, times like this worship are so important with uh, what we're going through as, as a nation. These are times of refreshment. And our scripture reading today, our second one, is from the Old Testament. It's from the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, verses 5 through 13. And uh, this is a portion of scripture where God is speaking to the Israelites, uh, giving them hope as they're just about to return home to their homeland after years away in exile. And we read beginning in verse 5, Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your own people who hate you and reject you for my name's sake have said, Let the Lord be glorified so that we may see your joy. But it is they who shall be put to shame. Listen, an uproar from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord dealing retribution to his enemies. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered a son. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? Shall a nation be delivered in one moment? Yet as soon as Zion was in labor, she delivered her children. Shall I open the womb and not deliver, says the Lord? Shall I, the one who delivers, shut the womb, says your God? Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her. All you who love her, rejoice with her in joy. All you who mourn over her, that you may nurse and be satisfied. From her consoling breast, that you may drink deeply with delight from her glorious bosom. For thus says the Lord, I will extend prosperity to her like a river, and the wealth of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you shall nurse and be carried on her arm and dandled on her knees. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. O oh, gracious and loving God, we give you thanks today for your strength, your presence that sustains us in all things. And we give you thanks today for those in our midst, all those here and joining us otherwise uh, who have spent so much time this past year uh, caring for others, uh, giving them strength, giving them your hope and peace. We pray, O oh God, that you would bless mothers and others who fill our lives with your grace and help share your blessings with the world. As we meditate upon your world, as your word today, fill us with your grace and give us knowledge and wisdom that helps us serve you faithfully. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a 95-year-old farmer, he owned a pond surrounded by beautiful fruit trees and perennial flowers uh, that he'd planted years earlier. But one day, uh, he grabbed the bucket 
And he headed down to his pond to pick some fruit from his trees. When he arrived, however, he found three teenagers raucously swimming in the pond, damaging many of the flower plants around it. One of the teenagers looked up at him and said, Look, old man, we're not leaving your pond, and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, lifting his bucket very calmly, the farmer replied, Oh, don't worry about it. You go right on doing what you're doing. I just came down to feed the alligators. <laughs> Yet, uh, sometimes things happen quickly in life, uh, like, for instance, obnoxious teenagers exiting certain ponds. That can happen quickly. But the same thing is true at times about the visibility of God's blessings after traumatic experiences. Now, many times after we've gone through a nightmarish experience, God's blessings quickly manifest themselves in ways that are much easier for everybody to see. They're, they're very visible. Uh, the English church historian Thomas Fuller, he uh, put it this way in this famous phrase. He said, it is said that the darkest hour of the night comes just before the dawn. And that's what's happening or beginning to happen right now. For now, in our nation, in some other places in the world, when it comes to this health crisis we've been suffering through. Since, as Scripture tells us, every good and perfect gift is from above, it's God who has worked through our scientists medical professionals and frontline workers and everyone else who's bringing an end to this worldwide scourge. It's upended so many people's lives. Giving everybody in the process glimpses of the end of this thing in the future so that one day, one day we don't have to see as many people's lives damaged and destroyed by this anymore. And with all these highly visible blessings that uh, portend the end of this horror, there's a temptation for many of us as we see these things to kind of set our feelings, to brush our feelings aside about what's happened so that we can just get on with life as normal. See, after all, this has been going on for over a year now, and uh, most of us are sick and tired of it. The last thing many of us want to do is ruminate upon our feelings about everything that's happened because, um, you know, we just want to get it behind us and to get on with life. But in order for us to receive and experience the fullness of God's blessings that are ending this mess little by little, it's important for us to think about what's happened because that's part of the healing process. If we truly want to move on, if we truly want to move beyond this, it's important for us to heal. Otherwise, the effects of what we've experienced, they'll remain. And uh, they can resurface later on in other harmful ways in our lives that hurt us and others. And moving on from a brutal pandemic, for instance, it uh, isn't like finally making it through a long line at the grocery store or, or even at a, at a sandwich shop, like a Subway sandwich shop. Uh, you know, finally getting the chance to order our Subway sandwich after being in line behind someone who took 25 minutes to decide which vegetables they wanted on the 15 sandwiches they just ordered. We might be able to say after that, you know, thank God that ordeal is over and walk away from things like that, but uh, we don't do ourselves or anyone else any good if we don't work through and heal from genuinely traumatic things. 
It's like a soldier uh, who lives through a horrible battle. The battle may be over. Peace might even be restored. But healing for that soldier, many times, has just begun. And it's about these kinds of highly visible heavenly blessings after great trauma that our scripture readings today speak. They remind us that our faith can help us journey through the healing process. And it's really cool. The way that they do it appropriately for Mother's Day is by using parenting imagery, including birth and mothering. Now, our passage today from the book of Isaiah, the one that we just read moments ago, it foretells the return of the Israelites to their homeland after the horrible destruction of their kingdom. For over a generation after Israel had been destroyed in 586 B.C., the Israelites lived as prisoners in a kingdom called Babylon, very far away from their home. When the Babylonians originally took them from their homeland, the invasion uh, that happened, this invasion was swift and it was devastating. People watched family members suffer and they watched them die in the process. Not unlike the way COVID-19 has impacted our world. And after burning the Israelites' temple and capital city of Jerusalem to the ground, both of which were central to the Israelites' identity, the Babylonians then separated family members from each other, and they hauled them away under horrible conditions to serve the needs of a foreign ruler and his people. Then, the Babylonians went about a decades-long re-education campaign, you could call it, attempting to wipe out what remained of Israelite identity and culture in the hearts of the prisoners that they brought back to Babylon. They didn't only want to destroy the, the buildings and the structure of their civilization in Israel. They wanted to purge the concept of what it meant to be an Israelite from the people's heart altogether. They wanted them to forget it and to become something else. But that didn't work with everybody. Throughout the ordeal, many Israelites, they held fast to their faith. They ignored what the Babylonians were trying to do. They held fast to their faith, continuing to worship and to call upon the Lord, even as other Israelite prisoners were mocking them for doing so. Uh, we read about this in verse 5 of our passage uh, that quotes a group of Israelite hecklers who are sarcastically saying to the Israelites who continued to worship God even though it was uh, unpopular to do so and even though they were being told not to. Uh, they said to them, let the Lord be glorified so that we may see your joy. It was a sarcastic thing. The naysayers believed that the trauma that they experienced was evidence that God either didn't exist or couldn't care less about them if he did. See, they possessed that same kind of screwy theology we've talked about before that says, I know God exists and loves me because these things in my life are going my way right now. Whatever my way happens to mean to us at the time. Now that, th that theology, it always seems to work until things don't go our way. Now, thankfully though, even though suffering is tragic and evil, it doesn't tell us anything about God's love for us. Suffering isn't evidence that God doesn't love us or isn't with us. God, in fact, suffered himself in Christ. And he abides with us, blessing us, even when we're going through a difficult time. Preparing us for moments when God's blessings become more visible 
to everybody. And that's exactly what happened to the Israelites. God eventually did restore the Israelite kingdom. No one thought it would ever be possible, but but God did it. And he says in our passage to those who, who worshiped faithfully throughout the whole ordeal, he says, before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered a son. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? Shall a nation be delivered in one moment? Yet as soon as Zion was in labor, she delivered her children. Shall I open the womb and not deliver, says the Lord? Shall I, the one who delivers, shut the womb, says your God? So, God here compares the restoration of the city of Jerusalem, the return of the Israelites to their homeland. He compares that to a mother giving birth. Giving birth so quickly that she didn't even experience pain. And uh, that's a beautiful thing for anyone who's ever given birth. No Pitocin or epidural needed from today's standpoint. Uh, This is how God, in this historical instance, delivered blessings to his people for everybody to see. Uh, People didn't completely lose their identity, even though the Babylonians did everything to crush their culture. Instead, Babylon itself was eventually conquered by Persia, another kingdom, whose ruler, Cyrus, wasn't into the whole destroy people's culture and forcibly re-educate them thing. But uh, instead, he allowed the Israelites to return home. Cyrus was only interested in, in money. He <laughs> wanted to tax the Israelites heavily. Uh, but, uh, but they returned home, and so their ordeal of being taken away and brutalized had finally come to an end. You know, it says the Apostle Paul says in the passage we read today from his second letter to the Corinthians, uh, Robin read it for us, where uh, he also uses parental imagery. And he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation who consoles us in all our affliction so that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction with the consolation with which we ourselves are consoled by God. That that Greek word that's translated as console there, it had the sense of calling people together to encourage them. It's actually the same word that's used to describe the Holy Spirit in other parts of Scripture. So that's the great blessing. The Israelites who maintained their faith during the exile received from God. But even though the exile from their homeland was ending, there was still healing that needed to take place. And God, in verse 10, reminds them how important their faith would be in that process. That they couldn't do it without their faith. When he says, Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. And you shall nurse and be carried on her arm and dandled on her knees as a mother comforts her child. So I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Is the Israelites, they, they carried their decades worth of trauma back with them to their homeland. God promised that their continued worship and their adoration of him would be a part of the process that would eventually help them heal. Just as that same faith had sustained them during the exile. It would heal them afterwards. And the same thing is true for us. We can see, for now, light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to this health crisis. One day, hopefully sooner rather than later, it will end. But God now is delivering blessings in our world right now in very visible ways. But we would be remiss if we didn't work through our feelings about what we've experienced. 
and an integral part of that healing process of working through the stages of grief and pain. It is our faith. It is our commitment to continue to worship the Lord, seeking Him and His grace. This pandemic, just like the Babylonians, might have placed a million obstacles in our path to getting together to worship God, but it didn't stop the Israelites from doing so, and it didn't stop us either. For throughout this crisis, we've called upon God, whether we're here in person or we're participating online, we've been together calling upon his holy name, and he will shower us with grace as we heal beyond this situation because of it. He'll shower us with grace as freely and lovingly as a mother showers blessings upon her child. So our passages today, they challenge us to ask ourselves, regardless of how I've suffered, do I believe that I'm of great value to God? That he'll never leave me? And that when I hold fast to my faith, he's able to work through that to completely heal and restore me? And if so, holding fast to my faith, am I willing to do the work necessary for me to heal? Because he'll bless us when we do. Amen.